Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sivewe Dongwana, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all for what is uh, sure to be a very interesting and insightful webinar uh, discussing the conversion of business rescue into liquidation, the highs and lows. At the outset, I'd like to thank Fluxman's, our sponsors, uh, for making this possible in support of both Saripa as well as the profession. We thank Fluxman's for this. It's also my great pleasure to introduce uh, Colin Strym as our chairperson of this webinar. And we couldn't have asked for a more seasoned uh, and experienced chairperson to lead this conversation. Uh, Colin will in turn introduce the panelists and lead this conversation for us. Colin, as a, an accomplished professional, uh, he has got a very long CV, and I'm not going to bore you uh, with, with, uh, with reading his entire CV. But I think it's important for us to recognize him as a leading lawyer, as a business rescue practitioner, uh, and then a leading insolvency practitioner. Uh, Colin, for those of you who have been involved in Sarepa knows he has been a participant in a number of panels over the, over the many years and is also a regular contributor to our profession. But above everything, I think it is important that we recognize that Colin has been recently recognized in both Chambers and Partners and Best Lawyers Awards for 2021 as the Lawyer of the Year for 2021 which is a marvelous recognition from the profession as well as from his peers. As if that's not enough, Colin was uh, the head of the Fluxman's team that won the Pumelela Dellmakers Business Rescue Transaction of the Year for 2021. We're very fortunate to have Colin chairing this panel and we're very fortunate to have his experience as a litigator, an experienced practitioner, and we believe that that is going to surely uh, be of benefit to all of us. Over to you, Colin, and good luck with the webinar. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saviwe, for your kind words. Thank you to Saripa for affording us this opportunity. And uh, I hope we all, and welcome to all of you, and I hope we're all going to have a very informative and uh, beneficial webinar. Um, you all know the topic. We have a very, very impressive panel, and I'll introduce you to them shortly. Um, what we'd like you to do is pay attention, of course, and then send your questions through, and we'll answer the questions at the end of the presentation if there's time. I believe there will be time, so please feel free to put all your questions through. Um, the impressive panel I have are Davi van Amerva. I don't think he needs much introduction, but I'll give you his CV shortly. Um, we, but Ian Fleming also doesn't need much introduction, and of course, Richard Lisinski who also doesn't need much of an introduction. But let me just take you through their CV shortly. Um, first, Darby. Darby, as you all know, is a qualified attorney. He was admitted as such in 1999, and um, his passion for insolvency and business rescue arose um, when he worked in the insolvency and restructuring teams many years ago for Cliff Decker Hofmeyer. Um, he holds a diplomacy in insolvency law, and in 2012, he completed a short course on business rescue at the University of Pretoria. He's currently a member of the Law Society. He's a member of the master's panel, the lead, one of the leading members on the master's panel of insolvency practitioners, and he serves on the main board of Saripa. Uh, he's a very well-respected senior business rescue practitioner with CRPC and also a member of INSOL. Darby has been involved in many rescues, uh, high profile. I'll mention just a few for you. African Cellular Towers Limited, Petsitakis Africa Limited, Pila Plant, African Bank Investment Limited, and he's busy running a number of rescues, Plainfontein Coal Mine, uh, Busby House of Busby, and the Inque Platinum uh, Rescue. Uh, Darby, thank you for giving up your time and for agreeing to sit on this panel. The next panel member is Ian Fleming. Ian is a chartered accountant. Uh, he did his articles, I believe, at Deloitte. He also found his passion for business rescue there. 
And uh, at the CMS Group, he gained his grounding in the world of corporate renewals, restructuring, debt recovery, insolvency, and worked with some of the industry's top professionals. Um, in 2008, he co-founded a company known as Debt In. It was a professional a finance services outlet specializing in the recovery of distressed debt. Um, and uh, in 2016, he co-founded an engaged business turnaround, a multidisciplinary turnaround outfit giving distressed businesses the best possible chance of success at a high level of decision making. At present, Ian is a licensed business rescue practitioner, a member of Cerepa, SICA, and TMA. He remains a chartered accountant and holds a certified rescue analyst qualification from the University of Pretoria as well. And lastly, the third panel member, Richard Lisinski. Richard's one of my partners. He specializes in business rescue and commercial litigation and general restructuring. He regularly assists in running business rescues as legal counsel. And he does this from cradle to grave, or more preferably, as we say in business rescue circles, the other way around, from grave to cradle. He takes financially dead companies, cradles them, and uh, brings them back to life. In this capacity, he's worked across a direct a diverse range of industries, including construction industry, liquor, mining, and textiles. In addition, he has successfully represented creditors in many of the largest business rescues in South Africa, recently represented the South African Pilots Association, and in a number of disputes with South African Airways, he ultimately got them a very favorable settlement. Um, he says, I must tell you all, he's happiest when he keeps business rescue practitioners such as Darby and Ian on their toes and at the same time deriving as much value as possible for his clients. Gentlemen, if you could all switch your cameras on. Thank you very much. Right. Um, we've chosen this topic because there has been some recent reported decisions dealing with business rescue practitioners and their fees and especially when there's this conversion from rescue to liquidation. So we thought we'd take you through that and give you a few other cases which are tangentially related to the subject matter. We hope it's beneficial, interesting, and that you gain some benefit from it and some knowledge from it. First up is going to be Darby. And for all of you, if we focus on section, I think, 135.4 of the New Companies Act, um, Darby's going to deal with a dinner judgment, and yes, I can feel you all trembling when you hear that, uh, the name dinner. We all know dinner. I assume, like me, we have lost or forgotten a lot of the information about dinner. So I've asked Darby to please just give us a short refresher course, take us through the facts, and then highlight the principles of a dinner, and then we'll Take a, a we'll have a short discussion on whether that amounts to a high or a low on the conversion from rescue to liquidation. Darby, over to you. Thank you, Colin, and thank you for your kind words. Um, yes, uh, dinner seems to be old hat, um, but can you believe it's uh, almost three years since the Constitutional Court gave their famous or infamous uh, ruling, depending on your point of view, and in preparing for today's uh, uh, webinar, um, I was struck that one needs to consider the impact that, uh, that that judgment and obviously the judgments of the courts that went before it has had on, on, on the business rescue profession. So uh, uh, maybe to test it, uh, our, our uh, audience today uh, and remind them that this actually dealt with a particular business rescue and uh, um, Colin said that there'll be a special prize for those who can remember who, what the name of the actual business rescue was at the time. Um, but it will forever be known um, and remembered as the dinner matter. So just a, a quick uh, a recap on the facts. Uh, um, the business rescue practitioner liquidated the entity uh, in less than two months after taking the appointment or the commencement of re rescue proceedings. And he claimed his unpaid fees and disbursements, which was mainly uh, outstanding legal fees from the liquidators without submitting a claim document and claiming that such uh, um, fees and disbursements constituted the cost of administration in an insolvent estate. The appointed liquidators could not agree amongst each other how to deal with business rescue practitioners claim and sought direction from the master. 
it was here that the long haul started when the master ruled that the BRP was required to submit a claim like any other creditor in the insolvent estate uh, in order to uh, share in the liquidation distribution account. It was this ruling by the master that the BRP, Mr. Dina, initially took up on review to the High Court. The High Court upheld the master's ruling and declaring that the, master, uh, that the business rescue practitioner's fees only rank in priority from the proceeds of unencumbered assets in the free residue and that they, he, he was required to submit a claim in order to share such. The business rescue practitioner then approached the Supreme Court of Appeal appealing the High Court's judgment. By this point in time, the matter was no longer about Mr. Dina and his fees or his outstanding costs, but it became the principle of whether or not business rescue practitioner enjoyed what was referred to as a super preference. It was uh, cemented by uh, no less than three professional bodies joining the appeal, uh, um, one uh, um, formed specifically for the purpose of the application, um, the financial institution involved, the liquidators involved, involved, and all traipsed off to the Supreme Court of Appeal, where the court essentially upheld the High Court's uh, ruling. And th the important aspects that came out of the Supreme Court of Appeal, basically three major uh, um, points that one needs to remember, is that the Supreme Court of Appeal told us that a business rescue practitioner is required to submit a claim document just like any other creditor in an insolvent estate. There was a second uh, important aspect regarding the dates of liquidation, which is not relevant for today's discussion. And then the third uh, point that the SCA uh, raised um, was compare, sorry, is the, is the order of preference that would apply in a, um, in a subsequent liquidation. And they went to some extent to compare the seemingly ambiguous provisions of section 135.3 and 145.5, and in doing so, confirm the High Court's finding that the unpaid fees of a business rescue practitioner can only be paid out of the proceeds of free residue, i.e. unencumbered assets, after the costs of a liquidator associated in terms of Section 97 of the Insolvency Act, but before the statutory preferent creditors provision for in Section 98 of the Insolvency Act. This judgment of the SCA was interestingly and based on a principle of an error in law appealed to the highest court in the land, the Constitutional Court. And so everybody traipsed off to the highest court of the uh, court in Braunfontein to see what the, um, what the judges there had to say. The principle is that the Constitutional Court found no reason to differ from the SCA's finding, but found it important to give further guidance in their judgment regarding the matter. Interesting things to remember is that the Constitutional Court confirmed the purposeful interpretation of Chapter 6. Very important thing, never to remember, not, never to forget. And the principal goal of Chapter 6 is that it is to avoid liquidation, but ultimately it is to balance the rights of affected parties. And in doing so, they said that it would have been inequitable to elevate the fees and disbursements of a business rescue practitioner above the rights of a secured creditor. So the re initial reaction three years ago by business rescue practitioners, and they interpreted the provisions of the Companies Act that, that gave them a level of security in respect of fees and disbursements, all the courts unanimously and consistently found it to be inequitable to elevate the claims to the status of so-called super preference. Many academics, and professionals, and even professional bodies expressed concern at the time regarding the principles laid down by the High Court, confirmed by the Supreme Court of Appeal, and ultimately entrenched by the Constitutional Court, some even predicting that this judgment was a death knell for business rescue. Some critics refer to the judgment as the first step in bringing an end to what became known as quasi-liquidations, under the auspices of business rescue processes. Now, three years later, let's take stock and see what has transpired and has the negative impact of the judgment as predicted uh, um, manifest in business rescue. Contrary to the predictions at the time, 
the judgment was, has not brought an end to business rescue, nor has it had the extreme negative impact on those individuals that practice the profession as business rescue practitioners. Quite the contrary. The constitutional judgment may well have been received by scholars as a low point for business rescue, but three years hence, the foresight of the constitutional judges must be applauded. The dinner judgment has ensured certain Darby, sorry. process and purpose. By Darby, first of all, sorry. and their right to proceed, teaching must uh, um, only accept appointments that generate enough fees and income. And if they do so, uh, and, and there is not, they do so at their peril. They have to ensure that uh, they get paid prior to the liquidation. And most importantly, they have to submit a claim document. So the Constitutional Court was tasked with finding an equitable solution between the competing rights of secured creditors on the one hand and business rescue practitioners on the other hand, and finding that the elevating of fees of business rescue practitioners above that of secured creditors would have been inequitable. So circling back to our topic of today, one has to acknowledge that from a perceived low point, the benefits, I mean, with the benefit of hindsight, that the judgment turned out to be a high point for all the reasons I've already alluded to. Thank you, Colin. Darby, thank you so much for that. Um, I know that Ian has a different view on whether it's a high or a low point, and we'll get to that much later in the discussion. But um, I think the one lesson we can take out of dinner, and that is the following. If there's money in the estate, before you convert to liquidation, make sure you pay yourself in full. Don't be a creditor that you have to fill in a claim form and lodge with the liquidator. Rather, pay yourself in full before you convert. But that's, of course, if there's money. So for all you business rescue practitioners listening in, please pay attention to that. Um, Ian, you next up. If dinner wasn't enough of a head blow uh, a few months ago, out came uh, uppercut to the chin in a case described as the Montic Dairy case. And uh, Ian, you're going to please take us through those facts very briefly and then just give us some findings of the court of Gamble, I think was the judge in the matter. And then we'll have a, a discussion thereafter about highs and lows on that case. Thank you. Over to you, Ian. Certainly, Colin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sevilla. Thank you, Darby, for that uh, excellent summary on Pina. Um, Colin, so the facts in the matter, the BRPs in the Montic Dairy matter filed an application for the discontinuation of business rescue proceedings and placing the company in liquidation in terms of Section 141.2 of the Act. The liquidation application was made on the 16th of May 2016, and the order was granted a month later on the 14th of June 2016. Between the application date and the date of the court order, the BRPs made payments to their firm, Mazars, totaling some 1.5 million rand in respect of BRP fees and disbursements. The liquidators claimed that these payments were void in terms of Section 341.2 of the old Act. Interestingly, but not, not surprisingly, the BRPs did not counter-argue for the court to exercise its discretion in terms of Section 341.2. One key element of the BRP's argument was the obvious question of what BRPs are supposed to do about the costs required to meet their obligations to place the company into final liquidation where they have concluded that there is no reasonable prospect in a matter. Um, Colin Gamble ruled in favor of the applicants, i.e. the liquidators, in finding that the payments made by the BRPs after the date of the liquidation application were void in terms of Section 241.2 and fall to be repaid by Mazars. Leave to appeal was granted by the judge, but the date for the appeal hearing has not yet been set. The judge's findings and motivations for his decision included the following. He said that the SEA in DINA had confirmed that Section 143 of the Companies Act does not relate to liquidation proceedings, while Sections 341.2 and 348 of the old Act do. He said that there is thus no inconsistency between or clash between the two statutes. He said that it is established law that the effect of Section 348 is to establish the concursus creditorum at the time that the application for winding up is lodged. And the retention of Section 348 from the old Act means that the legislature intended it to apply both to insolvency, insolvent companies wound up under the old Act and to companies wound up under the new Act, 
where business rescue proceedings have not achieved the desired results and section 141.2a roman 2 is implemented section 340 he said that section 341.2 forbids the disposition of a company's assets after the lodging of an application to wind up whether that application is at the behest of an ordinary unpaid creditor or at the behest of a business rescue practitioner who concludes that the company cannot be rescued. He said that the purpose and context of business rescue are obviously not intended to destroy the rights of a secured creditor, which is what the result may be if BRPs are allowed to pay themselves after the establishment of the concursus creditorum. He then stated that such a situation would not only undermine the very basis of the law of insolvency, but is to be regarded as unconscionable, particularly if BRPs were to pay out excessive and or unsubstantiated amounts. Thank you for that, Ian. So now we have on a conversion liquidation, a ruling of the SCA and the Constitutional Court that liquidators have to submit claims and certainly only get paid out of free residue. Um, and now we've got Montic, which says, and essentially, when you launch your application for liquidation and before the provisional order is granted, which is usually a few weeks later, if you, as a BOP, receive money and pay yourself during that period, that's void and must be set aside. So two, two downs on converting from rescue to liquidation. Uh, but I know that Gamble did say, oh, sorry, it was argued before Gamble for the BRPs that the decision of the court, if he found against them, would discourage BRPs to take appointments, and certainly those that do take appointments, this would discourage them from discharging the obligation to put a company into liquidation if the company couldn't be rescued. Now, Gamble countered that by saying um, this, the, the ruling that he made would actually encourage, and he used the word responsible BRPs, mindful of the parameters not to be encouraged to chase up unnecessary costs in a company that has a little prospect of being rescued. And certainly where they are aware of the fact that they do not enjoy a privilege to be remunerated ahead of creditors, that's the reference to dinner. So it appears to be a lacuna or a twilight zone that's now being created on the conversion. And it arises, if I understand the facts and the finding of the court correctly from you, in the following scenario, a BOP um, decides that a company can't be rescued. So he, he now wants to put the company into liquidation. He's owed fees and there's no cash. He's got no cash. He now has to incur disbursements by engaging an attorney and even possibly a counsel to draw and settle and launch an application and then to appear in court to get a liquidation order. What does he do? Um, I suppose that's the dilemma he faces. So, um, Ian, this understand that there would probably be two alternatives which I'd like to discuss with you and open up to the floor to Darby and Richard afterwards. The first is, which I don't think is very moral, but it's something to contemplate, is putting in a plan that he knows is doomed to failure, will never be voted, and then follow the process where in terms of section 132 i think it is 2c1 if it doesn't get voted in and nothing is done further the company then goes into uh, the company cannot be rescued and that brings about the end of the business rescue process and i'll discuss it with you shortly but the other is to then bring about what is now known amongst us as the quasi liquidation or the alternative rescue so put a plan before the creditors and say, I'll pay you a dividend higher than you will get on liquidation, and then just do a type of informal liquidation, either selling the business, and if you can't, then the assets, and then paying a dividend. Um, do you think these are, all, are good alternatives, and which one would you go for, Ian, or do you have another alternative? Um, Colin, your... Okay, so the first picture that you painted was... Uh, to file a plan which he never know, which he, he knows will never get voted upon. Um, firstly, this presupposes that the business rescue plan has not yet been published or adopted when the business rescue practitioner realizes that there's no reasonable prospect. Secondly, and more importantly, as you correctly pointed out, I believe that such behavior, although legally competent and perhaps not likely to prejudice anybody, is disingenuous and not, not befitting 
uh, of someone saddled with the enormous responsibility of a business rescue practitioner and somebody who is an officer of the court. Uh, that's just my opinion. Um, uh, your second alternative, which is to um, file a, a, a plan that has a fallback mechanism um, to provide a the type alternative, of, alternative yeah. rescue or the quasi liquidation, as we correct. I believe this is a much better alternative, Colin. I believe that business rescue plans should, by default, contain a provision that if a return to solvent going concern cannot be achieved then the BRP can wind the company down under business rescue and in so doing provide creditors with a better return than they would receive in a liquidation scenario. In cases where business rescue practitioner determines that a plan isn't working out, where it has already been adopted, such an inclusion in the original plan avoids the BRP having to go back to exasperated creditors, acknowledging that the plan has failed and then asking them to vote again to now have a better return than in liquidation plan adopted. I don't really enjoy having to, to do this. And I know Darby agrees with me um, in believing that it's legally incompetent to have to do so. Um, you know, you asked for alternatives, what the other alternatives were, are. Uh, in most cases, there will often be one creditor or more who are in favor of a liquidation uh, in most business rescue uh, matters. In which case, I believe that the, co the best course of action for the BRP is simply to allow that creditor to institute legal proceedings, in this case, liquidation proceedings, in, as allowed for by Section 133.1a of the Act. Yeah. Thanks, Ian. Um, let me put this to Richard. Richard, do you think there should be an amendment to the Act which would cater for this lacuna that arises from the Montic diary, dairy matter, um, if the SEA fined for the quota quo, um, I would suggest uh, an amendment to the Act along lines that when applying for liquidation, maybe there should be a set form, like you have a core 123.5 or whatever, give it a new number, have it as a standard form, and all the BRP does is just fill in and tick the boxes and files that. Um, with the court, uh, a simple short affidavit, a one pager, and, and the, the courts then give the order. Or maybe another amendment, which um, very similar to the, the B section of 142, where you just file a document when you come to the conclusion that the company can't be rescued, similar to the one you file when the company is no longer financially distressed and just take it out of liquidation and then just leave it in the hands of the director and shareholder and the creditors if they want to liquidate uh, to apply to court to liquidate. What do you think of that, uh, Richard? Thanks, Colin. I'd, I'd agree with you. It certainly takes care of the issues raised in Montec. <clears throat> and currently, as it reads, uh, business rescue practitioners are obliged to put the entity into liquidation, which is an onerous obligation. Um, going back to your discussion with Ian on alternatives, um, I just wanted to add to that. Um, the alternative itself is something that I'm seeing in practice uh, with many business rescue practitioners. I think they've created their own solution to the Montic Dairy problem uh, with an alternative rescue in that they uh, take the appointment and um, wind down the company publish a plan to that effect and the dividend is only slightly or marginally higher um, in business rescue than in liquidation but what they importantly do is they don't compromise a creditor's right to launch a liquidation application against the entity post rescue in the plan so you achieve the same outcome without really assuming the risk highlighted by Monte. thank you darby what do you think yeah. about the alternatives or an amendment? What are your views? Now, Colin, um, you, you refer to there being a lacuna, um, which is really occasion between the, the different timelines that, that are affected. I, I almost want to use or take a different approach on, on a lacuna and, and by comparing the fact that you know, a business rescue practitioner can um, terminate business rescue at any point in time if it believes the company is no longer financially distressed um, by simply filing a, a, 
the requisite notice. Um, we also have uh, the instance that you referred to when the plan is voted down, um, that, the, that the, and, and none of the other procedures are followed, that um, the business rescue proceedings come to an end. And our courts recently said at that moment, you don't even have to file a notice or do anything thereafter. It's at that moment of, of there not being any, uh, any further steps taken that business rescue proceedings comes to an end. Yet when we determine that there is no longer a reasonable prospect, the obligation is to bring a substantive court application. And I submit that lacuna can be uh, uh, remedied by giving the business rescue practitioner the ability to terminate the proceedings if he believes that there's no longer a, business, uh, a, a reasonable prospect, also by filing just a notice. In other words, returning the company to its creditors, uh, to, to its directors, sorry, and leaving it uh, uh, open for um, other uh, special resolution by the directors or an application by, by, um, by creditors. So for me, I think that's the, the easiest way to remedy the, the clear uh, problem we have is uh, to address uh, the lacuna as such. Uh, interesting, Davi. You, I think you're referring to the Kun judgment recently handed down in the uh, agricultural, Land and Agricultural Bank versus AFRI oil matter. It's a very interesting judgment, circulated by Saripa. Thank you, Saripa. Um, the judge, as you say, quite correctly said there, once the plan is voted down, um, you don't even have to file a notice taking it out of rescue. And he actually held against the BOPs who at that stage brought a liquidation application. He said you had no locus standi because the business rescue proceedings had ceased. You were functus officio and you had no right to bring the liquidation application. Very interesting case. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Darby, just to tackle you on one other aspect that you've raised, when you suggest as an alternative you have the right by just filing a notice to take the company out of liquidation. There are those scenarios where you've got the directors who are just sitting for that opportunity and waiting for such an opportunity. So they're not in rescue, they're not in liquidation because you've taken them out and they're just gonna strip the company dry. So I, do you not think that there might be a duty imposed on a BRP where the company is hopelessly insolvent um, to place it in liquidation rather than just bringing it out by notice and ceasing the proceedings just by notice. What do you think? Colin, no, I, think, I think it's too much of an onerous. I mean, the one thing we know is that when you enter into rescue, you already have financial distress. There's already problems in the company. And, and, and the road forward is, 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 is unknown. And at some point in time, the practitioner needs to be able to exit it if he believes so. Um, laboring the business rescue practitioner with, with, with this obligation and, and considering your scenario of an of a, a obstructive director or even shareholder who then decides to oppose such application, uh, may even appeal such an application. Um, I had a matter that took three years all the way to the SCA to be, to be liquidated. And that lived, and that was my responsibility to convert for three years, and I think that's a step too far. Um, we must be able to, to exit and give, uh, to, to Ian's point, there's always at least one uh, creditor that is uh, maybe a bank, maybe a secured creditor, maybe a large creditor, that would otherwise be able to or want to uh, place the company in liquidation and take up the, uh, the application. So we have to be able to exit. Uh, um, when we no longer believe that there's a reasonable prospect. We are not professional litigators. We, we're there to, to fix companies, not to, to get them into liquidation. Thank you. Ian, you did mention in your address that courts could exercise their discretion in terms of Section 341, Subsection 2, not to void a payment. And you also raised the fact that this wasn't argued by Mazars in this matter. Do you know why? And do you know the circumstances under which the courts would exercise their discretion? Colin, um, the, I, I don't think it would have been appropriate. I think courts would have been hard pressed to allow that, you know, to grant the BRP's relief in this case, you know, for the 1.5 million rand that they paid to their firm. Um, especially seeing as that was in respect of fees that had already been incurred 
work that had already been done prior to the liquidation application being launched. Um, I know, Colin, you've done more Section 417 inquiries than I have, I'm sure. So you're probably better versed on the you know, exact circumstances under which um, the courts would grant that relief. I know it has a lot of concern for, um, for good faith. It's, yeah. It considers whether um, the, the, the person to whom the payment was made um, was aware of the pending liquidation. And it also considers whether the disposition was in the ordinary course of business, if I'm correct. I don't know if there were. Uh, actually, very impressive, Ian, yes. Um, there is a case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For all those listening in, there's a case. Um, I think Prince Lou was the judge. Um, it's a couple of years old. And I think there they summarized that the discretion could be exercised. It's an ordinary discretion. It's not a special discretion. And quite correctly, you point out, they've got to be bona fides. And um, they then look at such things as, was the person who received the money whose transaction they're trying to avoid aware of the liquidation? In other words, a lot of creditors deal with companies where there is a liquidation application issued and served, and the company doesn't tell them. And they, during that period, supply bona fide goods to the company. And then when the provisional order is granted in terms of 348, it's retrospective to the date of issue. And this poor creditor had no idea it was going on, uh, finds that his payment's being attacked. So the courts attach a lot of weight to that. Were you aware of it or not? And certainly in this case, the BLPs were aware because they'd launched it. And another test that the courts uh, require there is, is the in the ordinary course of business, the, the payment made? Is it a supply, the payment for materials and that the company that went into liquidation sold them at a profit and they use the word, did it swell the company's coffers? So none of those facts and circumstances I think were present in this case. And I think quite rightly, it wasn't argued as a point. Um, I want to now bring in Richard Richard's going to take us to a very interesting judgment, which was recently handed down by, who's becoming a very good judge. Uh, a lot of us read her judgments, and I think enjoy reading her judgments. This is Judge Opperman, and this is the case of EBM Projects um, and its BRP, um, again circulated by Saripa to all of us. Um, Richard, over to you. Would you also very briefly, please, and briefly take us through the facts and the findings of the court and then we'll come back on a discussion on whether it's a high or a low for us on the conversion. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. I'm just going to pop the citation of the case into the chat function so everyone can see it in case they haven't seen it. Um, in essence, the judgment dealt with two competing applications. There were another two applications, but they're not relevant for this webinar. The first was an ex parte application brought by the business rescue practitioner of EBM to discontinue the rescue of EBM, place it in provisional liquidation, and grant a number of powers to the provisional liquidator. The second was an application which arose from this application brought by Hollard for an order placing EBM into final liquidation. I'm going to deal with each uh, on their own and then I'll summarize them at the end. Um, in the ex parte application, a creditor got wind of the application and intervened and opposed it on the basis that EBM did not comply with the notice requirements set out in sections 1412A Roman numeral 1 and 1451A of the Companies Act. Um, we've just discussed 1412A Roman numeral 2, so the two are interlinked. Um, and Basically, what it says, uh, Roman number one, is that if a business rescue practitioner discovers that the entity can't be rescued, he or she must inform creditors of this and then apply for an order discontinuing the rescue and placing the entity in liquidation. Section 1451A is equally prescriptive. It requires that affected persons are notified of court proceedings relevant to the business rescue. Um, which obviously they weren't in the ex parte application. Um, what George Opperman quite rightly found, in my opinion, is that any conduct that has the effect of preventing participation of affected persons in litigation is inherently unlawful. 
This is because such conduct defeats the statutory rights afforded to affected persons. And, and, and as is constant in those sections of the Companies Act. Uh, Judge Opperman then went on to dismiss the additional relief sought by EBM, pointing out that Chapter 6 of the Companies Act does not afford business rescue practitioners the power to apply for extended powers for a liquidator. Those are set out in the old Companies Act. Um, very interestingly, when deciding on costs, and I think uh, this will um, dissuade business rescue practitioners from bringing ex parte applications in the future, and um, Judge Opperman ordered that costs be awarded the bonus proprius as against the business rescue practitioner, given the true nature of the ex parte application, which uh, was um, transparently to attain a provisional order of liquidation without the intervening creditor being afforded the opportunity to place the version before the court. So in effect, even though the liquidation order sought was not a final one, granting a provisional liquidation order ended the business risk, would, would end the business risk of practitioners. And I'll quickly uh, deal with the hollowed application, which was brought because of the ex parte. Uh, here, EBM argued in their defense that Hollard didn't have locus stand out to approach a court to grant an order for final liquidation on the basis that only a business rec rescue practitioner had this right in terms of section 141 of the Companies Act. Uh, this contention was found to be incorrect as Hollard's application was actually based on sections 344 to 346 of the Old Companies Act. Uh, so ultimately, EBM's technical defense of not having locus standard was dismissed by Judge Opperman and Hollard's application was successful and EBM was placed into final liquidation. Uh, in summary, the key takeouts are BRPs can't bring an ex parte application with liquidation and rescue. Don't try you'll end up with a punitive cost order against you and with your reputation tarnished. And secondly, the notifi notification requirements to affected persons as ensconced in the Companies Act are sacrosanct and should not be circumvented. Thank you, Richard. Well, listening to you, clearly a high for affected parties in the case and a low for BRPs who thought they could try and cut any of the affected parties out of the process. Um, yeah, from a process point of view for all BRPs on this seminar, don't bring an ex parte application. In other words, don't bring an application behind the backs of any of your affected parties. Make sure they're involved in all litigation or processes and avoid the uh, penalty sanctions of the court. All right. Um, I want to also refer to a recent case which um, was given by a judgment by the SCA, which tangentially deals with the subject we're dealing with today. Um, the, I'm going to quote to you from Wallace, who's a very highly respected judge of the Supreme Court of Appeal. Um, he refers to certain sections in the Act uh, which are interest, of interest to all of us, although it was obiter. Um, the importance of these sections that it clearly gives an insight as to how he thinks and probably how the SCA is going to deal with these sections when they come before the SCA in due course. Um, this comes out in the first of the Knup and others and Guptas and others judgment. It's the Wallace judgment. And I'm going to read to you from paragraph 30 and a few of the paragraphs thereafter, and then we'll open up for some discussion. It does deal with what was raised earlier is whether BRPs are officers of the court, and whether BRPs assume the duties or become directors of the companies they take control of. And this is what Wallace had to say when dealing with these sections, although they weren't, as I say, uh, part of the ratio of his judgment, obiter, they're very interesting to listen to. So please pay a bit of attention for a few minutes. Uh, paragraph 30 of the judgment, he says, section 140. 3A of the Act says that during business rescue proceedings, the practitioner is an officer of the court and must report to the court in accordance with any applicable rules of or orders made by the court. And this is what he says. This is somewhat a mystifying provision. It was pointed out that a voluntary business rescue is an entirely private process involving the company, the BOP, and all affected parties. In other words, the courts aren't involved in a voluntary business proceedings, 
And he said, unless the court is approached for some reason, for example, to set aside the resolution to commence business rescue, as we've dealt with now in, in most of the cases, or the appointment of a BRP, or the BRP applies to place the company in provisional liquidation, the process takes place without any engagement at all with the courts. So he says, you're running your entire voluntary process and the courts are not involved. Therefore, he says, in those circumstances, it is, it is difficult to ascribe any meaning to the provision that says they are officers of the court. So the courts are not involved. Why would a BRP, he says, become then an officer of the court in a voluntary rescue? In paragraph 31, he says, the obligation to report to the court in accordance with any applicable rules of the court is equally mystifying. There are no rules of court imposing an obligation on BRPs to report to it nor are there any orders by a court requiring reports. In a voluntary business rescue, the only occasion on which a BRP is required to inform the court of anything is under 141, subsection 2, subsection A of the Act, when they conclude that there is no reasonable prospect that the company can be rescued and apply for its liquidation. So these are very interesting views. Um, he then goes on in section one, in section 30 or paragraph 30 to say, and I'll paraphrase and quote only extracts thereof. With a voluntary business rescue, it is unclear how the court is to be informed or what it is to do with this information. A judge faced with an unopposed or probably ex parte application, the motion court, in which no relief was asked and no order could be made, would rightly question whether it was properly before the court. The BOP merely has to file notice of termination of business rescue with the CRPC. This brings the business rescue to an end. Section 141 in brackets, two in brackets, B seems inapplicable in the case of a voluntary business rescue. So it's quite interesting, especially where we've spoken about all the alternatives available to BOPs to avoid the liquidation. Um, Darby, do you have any comment on what Wallace had to say? I'm actually quite excited about what, <laughs> what Wallace <laughs> said. Uh, um, you know, many of us have, have, have asked those questions, and and I think what the what the good judge said to us is that he's, he's given us a hint that uh, when these kind of questions do come before me uh, or before this bench, uh, um, that they have a particular view. So. Um, Absolutely, I'm quite excited on, 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 on hearing that there's some highs for, for, for practitioners, uh, um, especially the one regarding uh, uh, being a quasi-director or liability in that instance, and, and uh, even the, the, the reference to an office of the court. So, yeah, I think we, we can, considering that you've knocked us all on, on lows so far today, that's maybe something we can, uh, we can get excited about. Yeah, he, he says, and listen to this, in my view, whatever relevance the description of a BRP as an officer of the court may have in the context of business rescue ordered by the court under section 131 of the Act, it has no application to a voluntary business rescue, and these provisions should be construed accordingly. Very interesting. Richard, what do you think? Do you agree? I do, Colin, and it also... Um... I think I, I can understand Davi's excitement because uh, in, in such a situation, uh, business rescue practitioners often uh, have a, a difficult choice to make. Um, and and that, that's, that's risen in practice in, in, in publishing a plan that, that, that's doomed to fail, unfortunately. Ian, I'm going to uh, read you an other paragraph, if you can comment on it. Um, he says further, in any event, I do not think that describing a BRP as an officer of the court adds anything to their duties or responsibilities. Do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I like the title of officer of the court because it reinforces good faith, duties of good faith, and, um, avoidance of conflicts of interest and so on. And I think the judge... Um, it also stated in the judgment that uh, in, with respect to BRPs and voluntary business rescues that 
At most, the title conveys that a fairly high standard of personal integrity is called for from the person so described. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with that. Um, and, you know, I support the title of officer of the court. Um, that's my view. Right. Let me <laughs> read you a short extract from his judgment. Again, dealing with section 140, subsection 3, subsection B, which says that BRPs have, quote, the responsibility, duties, and liabilities of a director of the company as set out in sections 75, 76, and 77 of the Act. And he says, like the previous provision, this is an unfortunate legislative shortcut given that the directors of the company remain in office and perform their duties subject to the authority of the BRP. The BRP does not become a director of the company for the purposes of the sections in question. Um, example, section 75 deals with personal financial interests of a director and their duties of disclosure in relation to matters coming before the board of directors. So it is difficult to see how this can operate in relation to the BRP. In other words, if the directors can't make decisions without the BRP, who does the BRP go and disclose that he's signing a contract with a family member with and get a decision from the directors? Mm. Yeah, he simply cannot. He's not allowed to do that in any way, in any way whatsoever. I mean, we, oh. we all know that the Act is explicit about independence. But, uh, you know, it's just one of those conundrums that, uh, that, that are, are created by the Act, which there are various. And, you know, I think, in my opinion, those conundrums can be, conundrums like that can be overlooked, you know, in the interests of enforcing the um, duty of good faith and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. Garvey, what do you think about uh, Wallace's comments on BRPs and their duties that they assume as directors? You know, I, Colin, I've always maintained that, you know, the obligations that you have pursuant to your statutory appointment exist. You don't need to be a branded a, a director to make you uh, responsible or even liable for for, uh, for for certain things. So for me, again, Rashad, I'm very excited about the, the judge indicating that I'm not a director of a company. I'm not registered as such at CIPC, but I have certain obligations as a professional and, 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 and taking that appointment that, that one doesn't take lightly. But I think it's a uh, it's an artificial co construct to try and uh, reverse you into being a director. Uh, so I, I, I quite like and agree with, with the good judges, uh, um, even if it is an obiter uh, remarks there. Rishab, what are your views? Uh, Colin, just listening to those comments, I'm, uh, I'm thinking to myself whether uh, it actually just brings up a whole ethical argument. Uh, and I think that's a discussion for another day. But ethically, I think just practitioners are obliged for to tie into my case to notify um, all parties of anything that's happening, which I, I find in practice doesn't always happen. Um, and the, the punitive sanctions for not notifying um, should be uh, should be upheld by our courts. I mean, I think, uh, as Darby says, um, even though you may not be uh, titled as a director, those ethical obligations um, really just go with your reputation. And if you, if you flout them, I don't think you're going to get appointments in the future. Okay. Right. So we see, and we're listening to dinner, and listening to Mondic, we see that BRPs are held to the mercy of liquidators. So on a lighter note, there's a provision in Chapter 6, that I think gives, may make the BRPs feel a little bit better. 136.4, and it reads as follows. If liquidation proceedings have been converted into business rescue proceedings, the liquidator is a creditor of the company to the extent of any outstanding claim by the liquidator for any remuneration due, for work performed or compensation for expenses incurred before the business rescue proceedings began. So, Ian, how would you pay a liquidator under those circumstances? Um, how would I pay a liquidator under those circumstances? <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly in terms of uh, in terms of how it's described by the Act, Colin. 
Um, I think that that you know that that also brings up the discussion about um, you know periods of limbo and so on, which uh, which is relevant to you know to Montic. Um, the Montic obviously creates, like you described, the judgment creates a lacuna or or a period of a period of limbo whereby a company is neither in business rescue nor in liquidation. Um, and similarly, that situation is um, arises when a business rescue application is made uh, when a company is in liquidation and the liquidation is, is suspended. So maybe that's a, a discussion for another day, but it certainly is something to be dis that can be discussed in light of uh, in light of Montic as well. Thank you. Darby, you wear both hats. You're an outstanding liquidator and an outstanding BLP. When you get a liquidator's account in a company that you've been appointed as a BLP, how are you going to deal with him or her? Now, Colin, it goes back to that age old uh, discrepancy where, you know, even in provisional liquidations that uh, years later end up in a discharge of an order uh, where the, the appointed provisional liquidators lie in terms of, of, of being remunerated. A liquidator can only be paid from the proceeds of assets that he sells and pursuant to an adopt, uh, um, a confirmed liquidation and distribution account. So um, it seems that just it, it's heaping on even more pain on, on liquidators who uh, spend time, work hard, and then much later is confronted with a, with, with a conversion to business rescue. So um, unfortunately, that's, that's the rules of the game. You, you then have a cold comfort of a claim in, in, in the rescue. And if for argument's sake, the rescue ends up being a, a compromise of creditors where all creditors get a sense in the rand, you will get your sense in the rand. So it does seem that uh, to be inequitable, to use the words of, of, of the constitutional court in, in, in dismissing the super preference of a business rescue practitioner, but a liquidator being left high, high and dry for the time spent uh, on a matter. So um, yes, maybe something else that needs to be, be looked at. Um, yeah. yeah. I see someone's asked us if these rulings were included in the GLD case. I'm not familiar with the GLD, but if you're looking for the citation on the Wallace judgment, it's Knoop and another versus Gupta and another 2021, volume three, SA 88 SCA. Right. Um, Ian, just back to you. Um, your views on dinner, high or low? And your views on Montic, high or low? Um, for Colin, for me, dinner is, is a high. I've never. You know, I, I've, I've never from the outset really understood what all the fuss was around Dina because, you know, in my mind, and I know you agree with me on this, Chapter 6 never conferred super preference um, on BRPs, I don't believe. Um, Section 134.3 is quite explicit in that if a BRP wishes to dispose of property over which another person has security, then the prior consent of that person is required unless the proceeds would fully discharge that person's indebtedness um, protected by the security. So, you know, for me, you know, Dina, in my personal opinion, Dina was always the correct, um, you know, correct, the correct judgment. Um, as far as Montic goes, um, I, I believe that it certainly is a low. I believe that the, um, it's a good, opportunity for the SCA to turn it into a high. Uh, I believe that what needs to happen is that the SCA needs to hear the Monte case and needs to determine that section 132.2A2, Roman 2, sorry, um, which states that business rescue proceedings end when the court has converted, past tense, has converted proceedings to liquidation proceedings, that they should find that section 132.2A2 is contradictory to section 348 which states that the winding up commences at the date of the liquidation application. I believe the SCA should find that the new act therefore contradicts itself because items 9.1 and 9.2 of Schedule 5 of the new act state that Chapter 14 of the old act still applies to the winding up of insolvent companies. 
This contradiction should be viewed as nothing more, I believe, than an oversight brought about by the fact that the new act refers back to the old act in order to, do, to deal with the winding up and liquidation. However, the old act obviously never dealt with business rescue. Um, therefore, because section 132.2 of the new act specifically and explicitly deals with conversion of business rescue into liquidation, in so doing, defining when business rescue ends and when liquidation starts, the SEA and any reasonable person should surely conclude that section 132.2a Roman 2 of the new act should prevail over section 348. Davi? Monty, start off with, <laughs> yeah, I think to start off with, I think we, we, we all have to acknowledge that neither Dina nor uh, uh, Montic is the ideal set of, of facts, uh, um, you know, but rather focus on, on the principles uh, um, that underlie each of these. Um, I, I must be honest, when, when, when Dina was first, uh, um, first came up years ago, I was, I was one of those that was extremely concerned um, and held the view that uh, it, it, it will have an impact on our profession. But I have to, I have to concede that uh, today and in hindsight, and it, 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 in fact, to, to Ian's point, he didn't quite understand. And maybe he, he, he understood it better than I did at the time. Um, but I think dinner ended up being the right call. And I think we have clarity and certainty, uh, and we all know what to do. On Montic, um, I'm gravely concerned uh, uh, on, on the principle of Montic, that if the judgment as it is stands now, we are exposed. Uh, we, are, we have significant risk in, 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 in bringing an application or even opposing an application. You know, we can have an application by... Uh, uh, disgruntled creditor that wants to uh, um, upset an apple cart in, in a good rescue, uh, brings a liquidation application and uh, you have to oppose it. You believe you're doing the right thing. And for whatever reason, months later, it does end up in liquidation. And then you settled with, 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 that, uh, with that difficulty. And that, that does leave us exposed. So for me, Montic is a, is a low at the moment. Um, and I really hope that our courts can find, again, a purposive approach to find the, the magic in, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the competing uh, pieces of legislation. Richard, Dina high or low? Montig high or low? What is your view? On Dina, I'm indifferent because I always make sure I get paid on time and in full. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, on Montig, uh, I think it really... And, and I, I shared Darby's concern and Ian's concern. It really puts the, the BRP in a difficult position because uh, what do they do? Do they, and I see Hans Kloppe has uh, put a, a question to us on it. Uh, what do you do? Do you, you down tools and say, I'm not doing any work? Um, it, it really does make you think that perhaps the, the amendment that we suggested is the right way to go. Um, and I mean, I mean you, can't, you can't always... You can't always, and, and, and although we say it, you've got to take, you've got to uh, conduct a proper financial assessment, um, you can't always see into the future. I mean, you, an entity that looks great when, when you put it into rescue, all sorts of circumstances like COVID and, um, and force majeure being, um, uh, being um, taken and in, in, on contracts can lead you to a situation where uh, you've got no choice but to put in liquidation. It's something you could never have, have, se have foreseen, and uh, you're now at risk of, of doing it all for free. And that's, uh, that's something that I think needs to be remedied in the future. Thank you. I can't see Hans's question, so I'm going to come back to it and ask you to read it out. It's not coming up on my screen. So, Hans, I'm not ignoring you. I just for some reason, it hasn't come up on my screen. I'll just go through the quick ones that are there. There's an anonymous question that says, I think this is for you, Darby, for Petsitakis, because it says liquidations converting to business rescue. Surely these should be few and far between. How often is this happening in practice? And if I go back by memory, I think my only knowledge of what ever happening was in the Petsitakis matter. Is that right, Darby? Now, Colin, there's actually quite a few that I can immediately think on. Uh, mm -hmm. um, for example, right now, I'm, I'm the appointed liquidator of, of the entity that owns the Gautrain station and other property there. Mm -hmm. um, it is the subject of, 
is a competing business rescue application that is going to go all the way to the SCA. So, so me and my co-appointees uh, are provisional liquidators of mm -hmm. uh, a company with a significant asset uh, that may end up in the fullness of time being converted to a business rescue. Now, with COVID, uh, um, it may even take longer. It can take as much as two years before before we, we have clarity on that. And, and what happens to the time and the, the, the fees that we've, uh, or time and the expenses we've incurred uh, up to that point in time. So that's a practical example. Um, I know of another one that uh, after a second meeting of creditors, uh, well down the line, the court actually converted the liquidation to a business rescue as well. Um, so it's not, it's not common, but it's not unusual. Mintails, min Colin, Mintails is before uh, the courts currently as well to take it out of business uh, liquidation and to and to put it into business rescue by the credit. So it is happening quite often in practice then. So anonymous, there's your answers. It does happen. And it Look, sounds like there are current, there's two current big ones that are running at this point in time as we speak. The next question I think is for you, Richard, because you're in favor of the alternative or quasi liquidation. The question is from Chepo Madupi. He says, what happens when the company, what is now called winding down, Will that company ever be liquidated simply because prospect of no rescue was identified? So uh, I, th I think we just need to identify what happens at the end of this process is the company itself doesn't necessarily uh, disappear. Um, the company itself may come out of rescue, albeit in a different form um, with its assets sold. Um, and the, you always preserve that right to put it into liquidation at that stage. So any creditor uh, who wants to do so can do it. This right hasn't been compromised. Thank you. Um, can you see Hans's question? For some yes, strange I think, reason. I think, I think we may have spoken to it. I think we may have spoken to it already, but I'll read it out. Thank you. What is the panel's view on what a BRP should do when a hostile liquidation application is launched and liquidation proceedings then commence in terms of Section 348 of the Old Companies Act? Resign as BRP, hand the assets to directors to look after it, or do nothing? Because if they cannot be paid post the filing for liquidation, then they surely cannot be expected to fulfill any function or do any work. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what we've been debating, Hans. We've put up the alternatives. I think the most popular of all amongst the panel would be to do the quasi or alternative wind down, not the others. And yeah, it creates that lacuna, which is certainly from a financial perspective to a BRP high risk and very unfair. Uh, anybody else want to comment? All right, I can't see any other questions. They don't seem to be coming up on my screen. Um, Richard, there's, Colin, there's another one. Can I read please. it for you? Please. Um, so, Kluter, uh, Kluter Murray, uh, my colleague from Pretoria, says, uh, he just has one comment. He says, both the Dina and the Montic judgments were the court's attempt to try and curb the rampant abuse, which is prevalent in many business rescue proceedings. Neither of these judgments will have any effect on the professional BRPs, and the manner in which they deal with matters. So I think it's almost a, a comment by, by, by Kluter. It's not a, a question as such, but I think uh, if I may, while I've got the, the floor, I think it speaks to the fact that I said, you know, unfortunately, both Dina and Montic aren't the ideal set of uh, facts mm. um, and, and case studies that, that are ending up um, at, at the highest court in the land. But if we, if we forget that just for the moment and, and perhaps um, you know, the, the, the comment by, by Kluter of rampant abuse, um, I, I wasn't aware, I'm not aware of rampant, I'm sure I'm, I'll concede that there's abuse, but I don't think it's rampant necessarily. Uh, um, but yeah, um, that, that's, that's my comment on, on yeah. Kluter's uh, comment. Yeah. Kluter, good comment. I agree with you. Yeah, it's the theme that's flowed through in the, in the judgments, I think. The court's balance, um, whether it's as they say, scrupulous or unscrupulous BRPs grab hold of companies and then what they do with them. So I agree with you, Kluter, yes. Um, this is, the courts seem to be aiming at, at curing a, a problem that arises on the unscrupulous side rather than on the scrupulous side. 
Um, any other comments? Because I see we're out of time and we're getting to the end of the seminar, or the webinar. Ian, any closing comments from you? Um, nothing from my side. Uh, nothing from my side, Colin. Thank you, Richard. Business rescue is still a good alternative, and uh, don't discount it because of these judgments. <laughs> Support that, Darby. Um, nothing um, more, just to maybe thank you to you, Colin, and to my colleagues. It's been great fun uh, in preparing for this, and as always, uh, um, intellectually stimulating to have these debates. Thank you. Oh, great. I see Lizelle's sent us a compliment. Thank you, Lizelle. She says, quote, thank you, everyone, for a great discussion. Thank you, Lizelle, for your participation. Um, right, so we're coming to the end. Um, as you all heard, differing views as to whether these cases are highs and lows. So not, not, there's no right or wrong decision um, whether or not BRP is applying for liquidation amounts to higher or low and whatever your views. We at Saripa and Fluxmans hope you have learned something from this webinar, that you've gained some benefit from it. And um, at least you, you now, I think having heard the case law, know what you should and should not do when you do apply to put a company in liquidation. Uh, the case that Richard dealt with, set that out. And all I can say is uh, I'd like to thank Saripa for this opportunity again and for arranging the webinar. I'd like to thank Angela and Haroon and Saviwe for all your assistance and time in uh, setting this webinar up. And I certainly would like to thank my panelists, um, Davi, Ian and Richard, for your valuable insights, your, your knowledge, and of course, your very valuable time. We spent a lot of time together debating issues and points and planning this webinar, which I've thoroughly enjoyed. And again, thank you all very much. And to all of you out there, once again, thank you for your participation. And I hope you have learned something and enjoyed this webinar. Enjoy your afternoons, and as they say on every webinar, be safe. Thanks very much, Colin. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you for attending this webinar.